it's like this. The very brief history is that back in the 80s, we had project assigned technical advisors, mainly recruited uh, by Danita, and they were sought to develop capacity. That was kind of the, the good old model, send in the expert, show how things are done, and then uh, our partners would be able to do so. We called them recipients. We may sometimes still do that, but we have found other words for the same thing. In the mid-80s, it was realized that just doing projects and believing they would work didn't really work, and, and that led to the concept of PRT, project-related training, uh, where, where training was added as a specific component to projects. So if there was a power plant, there would also be a training component. I was, at that point in time, calling myself a sociologist, and I entered a power plant as a training consultant, and they looked at me and said, sociologist in a power plant? Are you crazy? What, what, what's this guy doing here? But it was an attempt to make a systematic approach to training. I think it had its value, but of course it was focused on, say, a power plant, how to maintain it, how to run it. When we came to the late 80s, then the first thinking in Danita about institutional aspects began to come to the fore. I'm not saying it was not there before, but, but the first time it, it became articulated was around 88. There was a document, a report called Institutional Aspects of Danish Project Assistance, and there was a Nordic Technical Assistance Personal Evaluation, uh, a joint Nordic one, that very clearly said, yes, uh, Technical Assistance Personal has a lot of useful functions, such as to ensure disbursement of money on time, etc., but they do not support capacity development. That finding was repeated in every single evaluation on technical assistance done ever since. The big one, 92, Elliot Burke and company done for UNDP, another one in 2002 and 2003, etc. So at that point in time, it was very clear that the traditional model didn't work. And in 1991, we actually had in Danita a seminar, and I found the <laughs> folder. It was nearly before we, I, I don't have it on computer anymore because the computers was kind of not having big hard disks. But we had a seminar on how to anchor development assistance in local institutions. And that I think was one of the first time we realized very clearly that the models we had applied didn't work. It was followed up in 97 and the, the, those who took the initiative to this course were, are in the room today. Elizabeth, I think you were the key driver of this. Uh, we had a six-day course on institutional development in 1997. In 2002 to five, because that was an extended process, the ROACH, the results-oriented approach to capacity and change, which was called between naive naivety and cynicism, was developed. There was a series of such uh, yellow uh, folders, and finally, at least what I know of is the 2011 Addressing Capacity Development and Danish Development Assistance. Just a few quotes from, from all of these years, and I'll not ask you, you can read them, uh, you can see them later, but what is interesting, is already in 1901, we talked about how difficult it was to go beneath the surface of the formal official picture of an organization to uncover hidden agendas and goals. System approach, patron-client relations, incentive analysis, back in 91, that is 23 years ago. In, 80, in 03, we talked about how capacity development takes time and is difficult to be patient, downscale support, check and support that external pulls and incentives are conducive, ensure that push efforts from inside the organizations are demand-driven, focus on specific outputs, etc. In 2002, we said, look for the possible rather than the desired. No single factor explanations, consider a much wider scope. Don't reinvent the wheel, look for commitment, balance of power and incentives. Look in, look out, look for the functional, rational and political perspective. I hope at least some of you have, uh, that it rings some bells that, that, uh, that this has been the mainstream of Danita's approach to capacity development. The last one, forget linear predictability, adapt or die. We had this pull and push thing, asking you to look internally into organizations from a system perspective,
from a functional rational perspective and from a political perspective, saying that organizations is always a balance of both. There is, you can look at them as functional mechanisms and you can look at them as political machines. You have to do both and you have to look at what's happening inside and you have to look at the pushes or the pulls from the outside on the organizations. 2009, uh, abandoned blueprints and engineering approaches, learn from military science and art, which is all about strategizing, all about tactics, adaptation. Uh, empower partners, flow and give up control. Small things to ask. Basics first, good enough. In 2011, uh, the, the guidance there took the further step of actually moving the key discussion away from basic organizational science concepts into change management concepts. And saying this is all about that change will only happen if there is an equation where the dissatisfaction with the existing uh, situation, backed by sufficiently strong powers, is bigger than the satisfaction with the current situation. Now, in that case, you also need to have a vision that is attractive and that is consistent in size with the dissatisfaction or, in a, in a sense, the power of those dissatisfied compared to those who are satisfied with the status quo. So there must be a balance. You can't have a grand vision if, if the real push for change is small. And the third thing you need to have is change capabilities. You need, and these are both political, they are communicative, they are managerial, they are technical. Unless you can organize a change process in all these aspects, change will not happen. That was the key basic messages in this 2011 piece. So this is the history as brief as I could make it. Now, then there is the issue, we have had all this, we had this discourse, we have had this guidance on this very scientific graph. You will see politics, flexibility, best fit on the top, and you will see technocratic blueprint, best practice approaches at the bottom. And this is obviously my personal take based on, on, on what I have seen and not in Danida exclusively, that the technocratic approach, when, when, when we began on this in the 90s, we also, the, I think the, the, the practice moved in the direction of more flexible, adaptive approaches. And I actually think that the sector-wide approaches, as at least it was implemented in some instances and in some, some areas, tried to be that long-term, more flexible approach that also allowed politics to come into the picture. I think that after ACRA or when the results agenda and other new public management ideologies became coming very much to the fore, that many donors backtracked and went away from this and became again more believing in the idea that blueprints and upfront ex ante conditionalities, uh, now phrased as results and indicators and all that stuff, has actually pushed us back. Uh, and made us more technocratic in our approach to support capacity development. Which means that some of the questions that I also hope we can get feedback on today is that, sure, the mess of politics and power and interest is here to stay. I also think that, that it's possible to get quite a good understanding. I mean, you, you'll find an amazing amount of literature supporting the understanding of what actually happens as the Dutch say, at a point in time, behind the facade. Uh, when, when we only see the facade, it's not because you can't see behind it, it's because you're blind. It's because you don't try to see behind it. It's, it's, I, would, I would claim that it's actually possible and it's done. It often needs another type of interaction with locals who will have a much better perspective on what's going on, but it's possible. And then the question is, what do we do about it? Uh, because as much as we are now saying that there is a political economy reality out there, we also work in a political economy reality ourselves. So, so just asking the donors to, to become smarter, accept politics, work with mess, is like uh, asking developing countries to have a more sustained political will. It means it's superficial, it's, it's uninformed, because there are realities in donor countries that make donors react as they do. And we have to be realistic about that, uh, but still, it makes it as interesting for us today, I think, to look in the mirror 
as it is to look out of the window. Not only because it's November or December and dark and gray, but actually because looking at ourselves and our practice and finding out what, what are the boundaries for doing better is obviously a challenging question for us. So what can we do better for capacity development? <coughs> Recognizing that we have for the last 22 years, more or less consistently in more or less detail, said some of the same things that we will hear more eloquently and better phrased from our guest speakers today. 